when my grandmother died, I had the sort of luxury of going through her house and kind of picking up things that I wanted to. At the time, I was still looking to be a journalist in my previous life. So I was gathering things that were kind of sentimental, but also detective-y. Like I was grabbing like like weird memento boxes, ID, um, things that just felt like they'd be kind of useful to solve a crime, I guess I would say. So that's what I was kind of going around for. For some reason at the time, it just felt important. Like, you know, I was, I can't remember how old was I? I was maybe like, 20 or something at that time. And I was like, I, I should probably take their IDs because no one else in this family can be responsible for the IDs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that had to be me. We actually call her grandmother Yingying, which is the Chinese word for grandmother on the father's side of the family. Uh, I called him, I call him Grandpa Foot. We in our native language in Hindi, we call them Dada and Dadi. My other grandmother would be Maman Bazur, which is Persian for grandmother. Which is true, means old woman in King Rwanda. I called her Safta, which is a Hebrew word for grandma. Everybody called her Mami Dita. We called her Mima, Mima and Dada. Grandma. Hi, I'm Steph. And I'm Robin. Welcome to Stories from Grandparents, the podcast where we share stories about and from grandparents. On today's episode, we have Robert, who told us about genealogical research that he did about his grandfather, trying to get closer to his memory and also solve a longtime mystery. What did you think of the interview, Robin? This interview was delightful. It was like we got to discover this mystery of what happened to his grandfather as he told the story. And I think our listeners are really going to love this one. Can you tell me why you wanted to come on the podcast? Um, yeah. So, I mean, for, for one thing, you know, I thought it was an inter- it was an interesting opportunity and it was kind of on, on time, timing with something that kind of came around for me, but more importantly, there's a couple of reasons. One is very personal, um, is that I really wanted to share this, what I kind of described as a very incomplete story of my grandparents, because for me, it's very helpful to keep my mind focused on them and thinking about them and keep the memories of them alive just because they both passed away a long time ago. And, you know, who I was then is completely different than who I am now. But where I thought it would be most appropriate to, I think, your listeners and why I thought it was a story we're sharing is because I wanted to share an avenue of genealogical research that I was able to use to get answers to questions that I never thought I could answer to. So that's kind of why I thought it'd be kind of fun. Yeah, that's amazing. Perfect candidate, really. Yeah. Yeah. So who are you talking about? We're talking about Charles Fisher Nettleton. So uh, he was my grandfather and he married Kathleen Curtis Pink. So uh, yeah, um, he passed away in uh, 2001. Um, from complications related to Alzheimer's disease, which is which is funny because it's not funny. Of course, it's not funny, but it's very significant to me um, in that <laughs> ever since his death back in 2001, every time I forget something, every time I misplace an item or if I wander into a room and I lose track as to why I wandered into the room, it, it causes like a, a level of weird panic for me. It's like this really strange legacy that he left that is really not really enjoyable. <laughs> I know. I think everyone who has Alzheimer's <laughs> in their family gets, yes. like, yeah. gets that anxiety, like, ooh, is it early yeah. onset? Here it is. Like, yeah, Yeah. (laughs) I identify with that as well. Yeah, exactly. Like, how many times have you Googled symptoms of early onset Alzheimer's or how early can it come? I'm sure you're fine. Everybody gets that anxiety. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) a little nervous. Um, Yeah, but um, I think one thing before I kind of share to kind of understand why I kind of went down this path or to to learn more about him, it's uh, without getting to too much of my own personal history, it's kind of important to the story as to why I ended up later in my life trying to figure him out. Um, and that's because mo- my immediate family system is largely estranged. So like, I don't, I don't really have a close relationship with any money in my family. Just, it was sort of like this drifting apart that always felt very natural and very safe. There was no like incident or anything like that. But so um, I haven't really seen my family very much, maybe once every 
a couple of years um, since 2005. So with that, you know, whenever you leave a situation that is not really great, you tend to push a lot of memories away. And so for me, that's kind of what I did is I pushed a lot of memories of my childhood, childhood mem- like relationships, um, really on this idea of starting anew. So why that's kind of relevant is that I hadn't thought about them in a very long time. And, you know, they died when I was very young and I never thought through all these years of, you know, however long it's been since 2004 um, or even longer to ask these questions questions around my grandparents. And it wasn't until I would say 2018 where I started to develop this longing to kind of find, you know, your figure out your roots a little bit, you know, learn a little bit more. Um, I, you know, maturity kind of kicked in and I started to sort of recognize that I had questions and I wanted to figure out more about my grandparents. So uh, they both died a while ago. So my grandfather in 2001, my grandmother in 2011. Um, the first thing I did, like in the millennial would do, which I just started Googling them. Um, because my I wasn't really talking with my parents. I didn't really feel comfortable to ask them questions at that point. And so uh, the only thing I was able to find on Google because they lived very uneventful lives was uh, was my grandfather's gravestone, which actually proved to be quite useful for me later. But uh, um, that being said, it was it was interesting. The one thing I remember about my grandfather that kind of, again, triggered this is after I started Googling them, I found really nothing. I started to go on Library and Archives Canada because um, what I did remember from my grandfather was that he was in he was in the Navy or he said he was in the Navy. But all I remember growing up with him, growing up stories about like him being on a boat and the boat was like sloshing all over the place and somehow he fell and broke his leg. But every time he told the story, it changed. In hindsight, I knew this was because, you know, he had uh, Alzheimer's, but at the time I'm just like, what is, like, what is, what is going on? <laughs> this makes no sense. It always kind of varied in, in weird ways. And my dad never knew the details either, because as, as is the case with a lot of people who go through the military, they, you know, they don't talk about that stuff. And they don't like to be asked questions about those experiences. So when I even asked my dad, like, what happened to the leg? Was the leg a thing? My dad had no idea. And so I had no idea at that time if there was any truth to it. But uh, anyway, it was always something that kind of sticks in my mind. He had like this massive scar up the side of his leg that kind of looks like, uh, I, I suspect like, for whatever did happen, they ended up going in there and like replacing bone with like a metal bar or like getting his getting a metal bar in there to um, keep it going because it was like a muscle scar. So that's one thing that I didn't, it, it, for some reason, it's always stuck with me with a memory whenever I think about my grandfather is like just like this story about his freaking leg um, that I didn't even know if it was true. It's very mysterious and very strange. And it's a weird thing for me to kind of fixate on even after all these years is his leg um, because it, I think it was kind of bothersome to me at the time. Like even as a kid, so whatever, however age I was in at 2001, I was just like, and then obviously the years leading up to that, I'm like, why is this different every time? You know, this doesn't make any sense to me. And I also had no concept as a child of what it meant to be in the Navy. There was this picture that used to uh, sit above the bed that I slept in at my grandparents' house. It was painted by a guy named Winslow Homer or Homer Winslow, one of the two. And it's like this guy in a boat um, in the middle of the ocean, like a tugboat, like a little fishing boat. And at that time growing up, whenever my grandfather talked about being in the Navy and being at sea, for some reason, I always looked at that picture. I'm like, oh, that's my grandfather. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like on yeah. this little, on this little fishing boat. It's on the, the front lines. The yeah. <laughs> on the front line. Like bringing in a fishing line. But you're mm-hmm. a kid. You have no idea yeah. what to think at that point. So it only, he, his story always fascinated me because of, the mili- because of the military history. But I never got to ask those questions. So initially, I went to Library and Archives Canada. And I'm like, okay, he says he was in the military. So a guy's got to be traceable. There's going to be military records on him. So I was searching him. I searched far and wide, variations of his name, his date of birth, middle name, last name, first name, even my grandmother's name at times, nothing. Not a hint, not a, not a reference. Um, I didn't know what boats he was on. I didn't know when he was on anything. I didn't know anything about a story other than his name, his date of birth. And, uh, and because of the stories that I was told, I didn't know what was truth and what was possibly a product of his, his disease taking over the, his brain at that point, I suppose. So initially I thought I was getting in way over my head. Um, and I knew at the time in my life, this was 2018, that I was just not, <laughs> I was not in a position to kind of like go do hours, days and weeks of genealogical research by combing through paper documents and archives at Library Archives Canada just wasn't something I was able to do. And not something I, I guess, care to do that much either, because it just felt like overwhelming and hopeless and I wasn't even sure what I would be looking for. Their digitized records online, as I said, had no history of him, no knowledge, no reference at all. So again, I did like whatever 
Melanie will do is I went, is I emailed experts and I'm like, okay, you know, and bless the hearts of this genealogist that I kind of like got in touch with because he saw through me. He knew that I was just looking for some basic information. I'm not trying to fill in some complicated family tree. I just kind of want to figure out like, what's the story? What is his life? What did he do? Um, and though he could have charged me thousands of dollars to do the research for me, he was just like, why don't you just do an A-tip? And I was like, what's an A-tip? Uh, <laughs> and so since my grandfather, this is what he taught, this is what the guy told me, since my grandfather's service was World War II, um, it was after 1919, there's no public record or public access to military records after 1919. The reason why I couldn't find anything is because nothing was available digitized uh, or publicly accessible, like online, for anything after 1919. And even in the archives themselves, from what I understand, now someone out there, maybe your listeners may be like, this is you're wrong, Rob. And I'm like, okay, well, this is a few years ago, so I don't really care. <laughs> but my, my understanding at the time was at anything after 1919, like you have to do special requests for, um, I guess possibly because the history is so relatively recent mm -hmm. and the people may still be alive. Um, their families may still be in the picture as well. Um, so that might be, but I don't know the answer. And actually, can you just explain briefly for the listeners what an ATIP is and how it works? Yeah. So an ATIP is, if everybody can do an ATIP, you'll see journalists do it a lot. Um, but uh, it's access to information and privacy. So any, like anything that the government kind of produces or holds onto, I guess is considered to be public record. Now they can like um, redact as much of the content as they see necessary, where you'll get like an ATIP that's covered in black strikeouts. But essentially you can request any documents that you want um, relevant to your subject matter interests. Like if you're really upset or interested in some level of government policy or some um, changes that have happened at the federal level or, you know, or, or provincial level, you can submit an ATIP, uh, an access to information request and get the records of that stuff sent to you because um, it's considered a matter of public record. So I never thought of doing this to my grandfather because I thought like, if he was in the war, it should be available online. <laughs> and I'm like, I shouldn't need to go, go through this route. But, but I've never also been like, I feel like there's other people who benefit from going through a tips related to military service because there's um, pensions attached to it. There might be family members who are seeking recognition for family members who served in the war. Maybe they were due for uh, acknowledgement, recognition, medallions, things like that. And sometimes you have to kind of prove lineage or, get that kind of stuff to just sort of demonstrate, yes, this person was my family member. And yes, in fact, they did serve in the war and here's all the documentation to prove it. So it was really interesting. So in order to do this, um, I, I got the application, the ATIP application. And the first thing I had to do was I had to prove that he was dead, which was pretty easy because as I mentioned earlier, I found a picture mm. of his grave. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> I yeah. a picture of his gravestone, um, which was really useful. And when I was going through my grandmother's house in 2011, I happened to grab um, stuff from his funeral, like his obit and um, a little memento card, like, you know, that they have a lot of funeral homes um, that kind of give you, you know, like they write like poems and stuff, Yeah, yeah. you yeah. know, so I'm like, okay, well, that was from that. So I have all that. And I also had his driver's license. Because of the IDs. Because <laughs> of the IDs. So I had receipts, um, basically, and I had a picture <laughs> of his grave. The guy was dead. Mm -hmm. um, the, the hard part for me was I had to prove that I was related to him. And oh. because I wasn't connected with my, you know, my family too well at the time, and I didn't know what information my dad had at the, his disposal to kind of prove that my dad was my, you know, my, the son of my grandfather, and then I was the son of my dad, and to kind of pull that thing together, I was really kind of stuck, and I felt really stuck. But then I went back through my funeral book. <laughs> the funeral stuff that I grabbed from my grandfather's funeral. Um, and again, I have to thank my journalist and journalistic instincts at this point. But in the family record on the funeral book, it indicates children handwritten, oh, yeah. and it has my name there as um, it has the son or the son, which is Daniel Nettleton, and then it has the grandchildren, which is my brother and myself as grandsons, and it's handwritten yeah, in there, there it is. on the funeral record. And oh, this is my Oh, cool. Yeah. So this is kind of stuff that I stole. So I was able to, I was like, okay, well, will this work? So I sent a picture of the book and sure enough, it did. Um, it worked. And so I had proof that he was dead and proof that I was related. And that's all I needed, except to wait maybe about another 18 months. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, um, 
whatever I was able to get back, none of it was redacted. I mean, cause there's nothing like terribly classified in there. Like, mm-hmm. as I told you before, a Google search would tell you very quickly, he's a very uneventful man, um, which kind of worked to my favor. So it took, it took over a year and at least one delay um, for me to get the information um, back from them um, when I actually got the request in. And when I did, it was really quite awesome. The content that I got, I got a huge, stack of papers and pictures and all this stuff that they took copies from, from the military records and sent them to me. So I was able to kind of learn that when my grandfather was 19, he, he joined the, the Royal Canadian Navy as a volunteer in 1939. And he was registered as a volunteer reserve member in a first class seaman. Um, so S E A M A N. Uh, <laughs> and I remember, <laughs> and I remember, I, I don't know why that, I don't know why there's suddenly I was, uh, 13 years old there. Your listeners might be confused. I'm there with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just, I just became 13. Yeah. Um, so I, when I got the stuff, I was like, well, I actually just recently in preparing for this podcast, I, I was like, okay, like I, I, I contacted my dad and my dad, do you under, do you know, like what exactly did a first class seaman do? Because like that information is not necessarily included on here. And my dad said, well, there's a picture of him that my dad has on, uh, on a boat setting off, setting off depth charges. I'm like, what the heck is a depth charge? And he's like, well, they're minesweepers. My grandfather worked on, on a minesweeper. He was a minesweeper. So essentially their role was um, to protect North Atlantic convoys from mines that were laid by the Germans. So, and that they were used to seek what my dad called his U-boats, which actually means submarines. So um, what my dad was able to say is my dad essentially worked on two, on, on, on at least four different vessels. Um, and his role was to seek out and destroy mines that um, were laid by Germans to disrupt transportation of like supplies during the war through the ocean. So it was real dangerous stuff that my grandfather ha- had to do. And it was critical and important for him to do to protect submarines and, and the supplies that were going to uh, help those who were overseas um, during the war. So that what my dad had said around like him being on a minesweeper was completely corroborated in all the stuff I was able to get. They even sent along a textbook sort of uh, explanation of one of the boats he was on called the Rayon d'Or. And all the timelines line up um, with everything I received. So I was able to find out when he registered. I was able to find out the kind of training that he had to do. so he was trained in medical. So he was obviously someone who was trained to be sort of assist in that kind of way. He was, tra- he was trained in something called gunnery, which I suspect is the use of firearms, um, boat work, seaman work, things like that. Um, I was able to kind of come across everything that he, all the training, the multiple months and years that he spent training in his position, the medals that he won. Interestingly enough, uh, I found that he was a bit of a bad boy too, um, because he had one account on his record of <clears throat> prejudice of good order and naval discipline, um, oh. which I'm going to read this out just because, and then I'll tell you what I think it means. So he was guilty of an act to the prejudice of good order and naval discipline in willfully disobeying the lawful order, order of Douglas Robert Joseph Haig, Stoker first, class official number, what, et cetera, being given in the execution of his duties as senior hand of the Naval Shore Patrol. When ordered to leave Hillcote, Hillcote's dance hall, he did use profane language in public, in public, <laughs> namely Hillcote's dan- <laughs> dance hall in Sydney, Nova Scotia. He did improperly leave His Mas- Majesty's Canadian ship, the Rayon d'Or, at Sydney, Nova Scotia at 23, 4500 hours on the 25th day of April, 1942. Whilst under stoppage of leave, he being apprehended by the Naval Shore Patrol at oh, uh, 15 hours, thereby remaining absent without leave for 30 minutes, which to me translates into guy went to a dance hall, guy got drunk, pulled off his superior when he was accused of being late. I laughed. Yeah, um, totally. <laughs> he just went and partied. He was able for 30 minutes and they wrote him up. Come on. Exactly. <laughs> like, give the guy a break. He's going to war. Give, yeah. the guy, give the guy a break. And like, he's just like, they're, they're porting for a little while and you know, he's, he's out having a good time and all these people are just, well, he's just getting in trouble because he was 30 minutes late and he told some guy off. No big deal. But that to me, my grandfather was a very quiet guy. My grandmother, and my grandfather were very of the of the traditional 
life, like 1950s gender roles uh, upheld. Like my grandmother was in the kitchen in the house. My grandfather was in the yard in the work, in his work. And, um, you know, doing manly things down at his workshop. And we never talked to learn these kinds of things. And so to know that there was a time in my grandfather's life, at least documented to a point where he got disciplinary action, that even on his the acknowledgement of the kind of medals he received, it noted that as a, oh, but, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of like yeah. you did all these wonderful things. Thank you for your service. But don't forget this one time. So, <laughs> when he told off another <laughs> guy <laughs> in the military. When he told off the man, don't you just wonder what he said? Oh, yeah. yeah. I wish they would have documented that. That would have given me a little bit of life. You know? Well, it's like, hard to know, like, yeah. because it was the 30s or 40s, yeah. you know, like, how bad would it have been? Like, now, like, I mean, yeah. if I use my imagination, like, oh, yeah. but I mean, back then, was it like, why you like whippersnapper yeah I don't know. Like, yeah oh no that's a bit silly but like yeah exactly like what exactly was going on did he meet someone there like mm-hmm. the story that you could kind of go with that I wonder like what was keeping him there or was he just like having like a a, a good time yeah, just with a his boys buddy night. yeah just a yeah. boys night you know were they like shots 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 exactly <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, some uh, some pitbull comes on, and uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're just cutting loose with some pitbull. Probably, uh, I think a lot of stuff in here, like, is handwritten that I can't always necessarily make out. Like, I got the names of the boats and the duration that he was on the boats, which again helps me figure out. Um, I can do research on those boats, those particular minesweepers, and find out what their trajectory was. Um, what happened um, for those those boats? Obviously, my grandfather survived, but I do know. What well, my dad t- tells me he does remember my grandfather saying that there was a there was uh, people who we had lost at sea doing their work. But I think my favorite thing that I got speaks to something that I um, mentioned earlier. It's the medical record um, about the leg. Um, ah, the leg. And that was really touching for me, um, just because it was something that I didn't even know if it actually really happened. And um, what it kind of turned out to be um, was that there was uh, there's obviously there's a storm at sea at some point in time, and it turns out that a couple of his coworkers uh, they were swept overboard. And uh, it it wrote here that uh, while descending an iron ladder um, from leading from one deck to another on the ship, uh, he slipped and fell on the lower deck. Patient felt immediate pain. And on attempting to stand, found himself unable to bear weight on the left leg. It was detained overnight in the sick bay after this was over. Um, he estimates that he fell 10 feet, left leg swollen, and then I can't read the rest of it, externally rotated. So that kind of means that it was kind of twisted, which coincides with the story that he would tell me because he, he, would, he would tell me that his leg twisted when he fell. Because he always told me he fell and his leg got caught on something and twisted. Um, that was the consistent part of the story, but that was probably my most exciting thing is to find the hospital record of his stay, a clinical note that kind of writes out sort of the, the biggest mystery my childhood wanted to know about my grandfather is what's up with this man's leg. And now <laughs> I have it. Um, and now I have it. And that to me was worth its weight in gold. So that's kind of why I wanted to share this is you know, if there are folks out there that have questions that they don't have the answers to, and they know that their family members did, um, any military service is to do whatever you can to get an A tip submitted and grab the information um, that that they can to to learn to get some answers because it leads you down. Like, there's so many places I could go here. There was even they even sent uh, they even gave me a um, I guess like after it was done after he after he was discharged after he after he injured his leg. I guess he had to meet with an occupational therapist (laughs) Uh, and um, essentially they sort of said, uh, they sort of said that he was someone of like, you know, like like average intellect would probably work well in like, you know, like factory work or things like that. And uh, my grandfather ended up working for like his entire career in Eaton Center um, Mm -hmm. and sort of like the corporate head office, that kind of thing. But it was just really cool to see the beginning of his journey his training up until the point where he was discharged and you know they said that he he's handicapped by limited education and a lack of well-defined interests he's been unable to find to decide what vocation he would like to follow and again this was someone he was in the war for maybe he enlisted in 1939 and he was discharged in 45 and uh, so that's six years so he would have been 25 
he's just kind of like I was at that point, you know, he didn't know what he wanted to do. He couldn't figure out what he wanted to do. He thought he was going to do something for so long. And then he got discharged for an injury and he does not know what he wants his job to be. So no particular ambitions going in one way or another. So that was kind of interesting to kind of figure out, you know, around the same age, he and I were in a very similar place, um, you know, with obviously different backstories. But Yeah, because that, that was going to be my next question is what did this teach you about you? My, I mean, again, without getting into too many personal details, I don't have a lot of, I, I like a lot of my extended family, for whatever reason, they, they have a lot of troubles and a lot of difficulties in their life. Not stuff that you're going to be hanging on your, like hanging up, being proud of and things you want to brag about. You know, I don't have stories that's like, you know, oh, my, my, this family member did this and that family member did that. And I'm so proud of them and yada, 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 yada. But For me, this taught me that to be kind of proud of sort of my namesake. When I was getting, when I got married, um, I toyed for a very long time changing my name because I had real no connection to my last name, really, um, because of the estrangement that I was experiencing with my family. And after I got this, I made the decision before I got married that I wouldn't change my name because there was a legacy that meant a lot to me that I was able to kind of learn about through this process. And it created such an attachment to my last name because it was for the first time in a long time that there's a family member that I could think of that I was so proud of something that they've done. Mm -hmm. So that was really important to me. Yeah, absolutely. In in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would say. Makes sense. And there's just something about uncovering a family mystery. Hey, that's like, you know, you put like years worth of kind of, you know, yeah. diligent effort into and yeah. figuring out this this childhood question. I am curious, what are some of the other versions of what your grandpa would say happened? Like, what did you picture? I just, I mean, I, I can't even think. Like, the, the variances were everything from, like, you know, he would say that it was stormy, then he wouldn't, then he said it wasn't story. Like, it was small variations in facts. Like, I think there was a one point in time he mentioned that he was pushed. He said he was coming down to get something, like, and it, with, there was no allusion to any stormy weather or anything like that or any anything at sea. I think at one point in time he told me he was in a fight. Um, it all kind of came down to him falling and his leg getting caught on something and twisting. But just having these records kind of cleared it all up for me. But it was, if, you, if you've known anybody with Alzheimer's disease, like there's, there's cons- consistencies and then there's sometimes embellishments or um, there's like loose associations or loose connections. And it was kind of that. I think sometimes you may have been blurring two memories together. And I think that's kind of where I got confused yeah. for, for me. Yeah. And that's also just how the human memory works. Like Alzheimer's or not, right? Like I had done this project. I don't even know if I've told you this stuff in my master's. I was like really um, interested in the foster care system and kind of how kids throughout how that process like evolved throughout history. And I was talking to my grandmother, who's one of 14 kids and her older her older sister. And they told me that so there was 10 Girl, uh, sorry, 10 boys and four girls in their family. And they said that they had one brother who had what they think was Down syndrome, but like diagnoses back then, like, you know, iffy, like they're not sure. But they said that people just came and got him one day and they never saw him again. And I became like so obsessed with finding out what happened to him. His name was Robert, actually. And, um, so I was like, I was asking, I would, I asked like a bunch of her siblings and they were like really cagey about it. Like, and I think that's something I didn't realize at the time was like their childhood was really difficult. And me asking those questions was, you know, like it was not a, it was not a happy time to go back to for them. And I was like, let's uncover this family mystery. Like what happened to your brother? Um, but anyways, I ended up finding out, I ended up kind of being able to, I found his death certificate. I found that he died by choking and he died in an institution in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Oh, wow. And how, how old was he? He was 19. Oh, when he died. Oh. And so my grandma's recollection is he was like 11, like nine, 10, 11 when he got taken away. My grandma has, was already married and, you know, had her own family by the time that had happened. Um, but she says like he could never talk, but he could do things like he would help um, their mom fold like dish towels and stuff. Like she remembers that. And she remembers he wouldn't even walk by their dad. Cause that's how um, like, you know, 
yeah uh, brutal he was he wouldn't even go in the same room like if he knew his dad was in the kitchen like he wouldn't walk in there so it's like he had some like you, you know he had like enough awareness to know what was like some sense of safety and things like that mm-hmm. right and he was always in diapers and so anyways i i had ended up kind of finding this death certificate fi- like that was kind of like a final project i did in one of my my classes was just like f- doing this this family history and talking about disability rights and kids going into certain different kinds of care and stuff like that and and yeah but it was this family mystery that like no one no one seemed to know what happened to him yeah. And I was on my way. My teacher loved it so much. She wanted me to present to the class. And I was on my way to school, <laughs> like on the like just getting on the bus. And my nan calls me and she said, you know, that project you're doing? I was like, yeah, I'm like just going to present like right now, nan. And she was like, I just remembered something. Um, Yeah, he oh, loved to pugwash and we actually saw him all the time. I was like, what? <laughs> Plot twist. Plot I was like, twist. Man, I'm like literally going to like tell this like heart wrenching family story of like you never saw him again, and like he died by choking and just you know like tell all this stuff. She's like, yeah, I remember we saw him all the time. Um, we, we, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Nan. Yeah, like what? And like this is months of like me contacting her siblings and having to like you know tread lightly around questions and blah blah blah. And she said that what she remembers was because he was in diapers is they had to still provide some of them. And so she remembers cutting up bed sheets and, ta- and into squares and taking them down to Sunset, where coincidentally my uncle works there. And he was able to get me some records eventually for for that. But yeah, um, and taking taking the bed sheets down there and visiting. And like he said, she said, maybe even like, um, you know, some of my aunts and stuff might remember that. But like she was like, yeah, I just remember that. And so anyways, I just went and I did the the presentation as if I had not received that phone call. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to. It literally would have undone yeah. so much of your work. <laughs> like the yeah. whole like kind of crux of it, you know? I feel like that fun, that kind of phone call happens in movies, like in like a rom-com yeah. or something, yeah. you know, like girls about to go on stage and like, you know, oh, wrong. Make up, make up something else on the spot. <laughs> I, <know>. I, just, <laughs> I just did it. But I was telling my, my roommate, after and her, her I remember her parents were in town and I was like I feel really guilty like I just presented a lie and like I didn't know how to integrate it in and he was like no Robin that's not a lie your project is about a big part about human memory and that's how human memory works is mm-hmm. like you we just repress things like my like she's one of 14 she has nine of her own kids she hasn't thought about this in so long and what she remembers is people coming and taking him away and like I did this work I was like, I know, I just would have been great if she remembered a little sooner, but you know, like, yeah. So, anyways, I didn't feel so like guilty about it after. That's really interesting, though, because I my, that was going to be my question. Like, how do you forget that you've seen him since? Like, how how could you say like, oh, and then we never saw him again when actually know. you had seen him a bunch of times? Like, I know. How does that work? But no, he's he's right. Like, a lot had happened to her since then. And I th- I think like to kind of I mean. You know, anybody that any, like I me mean, witnessing bad experiences and things like that, like we do have a really good way. The human mind is a really good way of kind of um, protecting yourself from re-experiencing those kinds of emotions and feelings and things like that. And sometimes I, I would I would imagine sometimes it's easier to forget and it's protective to kind of forget. And mm-hmm. maybe it, it's possible that she had been asked about that situation so long that it was buried somewhere in her subconscious of an experience that it's maybe too painful to remember or to think about. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're the human mind's protective in that way. Yeah. Or it was just like, she just didn't, I bet, I bet. Or she wasn't listening. She wasn't listening to you when you're asking the questions. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, Oh wait, or, or like, him? she had, the knowledge, she didn't clue in that that was, that was raw. Like she didn't clue in that, that was him that she yeah. went and saw or something. But, uh, cause I, I'm guessing what happened was, you know, through me reaching out to diff- the different family members or wh- whoever people were like, well, didn't this happen? And she was probably like, Oh yeah. Like, just like, oh yeah I did see him but like just like not like mm-hmm. oh, I did see him I saw him all the time I was like what yeah, 
<laughs> come on, Nan. Like, like anyway, come cool. on, Nan. You're letting me down here. <laughs> yeah, Let's get it funny. together, girl. <laughs> oh man, I, I could just imagine just like that cold chill coming over your body. I know. I'm just like, how do, I'm like, how do I do this presentation now? No, yeah. I just I had to turn off. I was just like literally pretended I never got that phone call. Oh, like, yeah, the timing it of it is I know. just crazy. <laughs> yeah, like Men in Black, me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly so, yeah. oh my gosh what i will I, I i'm I'm happy to know that you and i have a similar experience then it, it's it's fun to kind of play detective and um you know i i don't know if i'm gonna ever go like dig too deeper into like the different boats and things like that like i know my grandfather survived so like um you know that's enough for me but it was just kind of useful to have this stuff you know uh, the mementos that I kind of took from my grandmother's house at the time always kind of brought me back to him. Like that portrait I told you about of the guy in the fishing boat that's above the bed. I I've taken that with me. So I have that in my house. Um, and every time I look at it, I'm reminded of him. I, I have different knickknacks all over my house that are just relics of, of their home or, or his career. I have his old, his old, um, his telescope from when he worked on the, on, on, oh, cool. on I have, <gasps> that's old, amazing. I have, I have, um, hang on a second. I'm sorry. I have show and tell ladies and gentlemen. I have <laughs> this hat. Oh, have nice. that that's have a great picture. Hat. Handsome. Yeah. Hey? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah so i, I have, uh, <laughs> similarity yes so, <laughs> yeah so yeah. yeah i have i have his old his cap i have his telescope i have all these things so these relics kind of just they were just sort of like nagging at me mm-hmm. you know and i've always kind of wanted to learn, learn more and then for some reason like you get fixated on certain things so for me it was just like what like what happened to the damn foot and sure enough mm-hmm. i got it it was just it was just really kind of cool that this kind of happened mm-hmm. the way that it so did and cool yeah and uh, i mean and, and i guess the other thing i'll say is uh, uh growing up with him he at all holiday dinners he had a um a prayer that they would say my family wasn't really religious but when you're on a boat when you're when you're in the war um you know you're, you're around other folks who are and i guess when he was on at sea they came up with their own prayer um, that they would say, and they would, and my grandfather, after the war was over, he would say it to me, um, or say it around the table all the time, like holiday dinners. And I'm the only one in my family who has it memorized ever since that. And so I still say it, um, every, uh, every holiday dinner I'm around, I just say it to myself quietly. I Googled it. I've typed in all the words and it doesn't exist anywhere. So it's like this little piece of oral history that kind of sticks in my head and that I have, I have all the time. My, Whenever I do, when, when when my dad and I talk at holidays, he's always like, "Make sure you say Chuck's prayer." And I'm like, "Yep." Yeah, Would I. you share it with us? Sure. Um, I um, okay. I am going to take out the note just in case uh, I don't forget it. It's quite short, but it says, uh, "We thank the Lord for this our grub, brought from the galley in a dirty tub, with tarry hands and dirty feet, is what we poor sailors had to eat. And in these times, which are so bad, we thank the Lord for what we have." If we had more, we'd be damn glad. And that was it. Awesome. Beautiful. So, Beautiful. so these kind of relics stuck with me, and that's what made him very fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think too, when you're when you're estranged from your family, I can definitely see a bit of a, a yearning to to understand and fill that void with something positive. Yeah. And um, like you said, that that you can be proud of in terms of your namesake and yeah, sounds like you got yeah. that through this process. I feel like, I feel like I did. Um, That's great. Yeah, so so I appreciate the opportunity to kind of share it. I did want to ask you. There was another story you mentioned on the forum that caught my interest. Uh, if you're willing to share it about how your grandmother found out you were gay. <laughs> so uh, so <laughs> so um. So my, my grandmother died in 2011 and my grandmother and my mother were like oil and water. They never talked. And that's another challenge I have with my mother is that I felt like I was kind of put on a, on, on a, on a, on a dividing line with a, on an argument I got no say over. So I never had a really close relationship with my grandmother. All I knew is my mother's stories about my grandmother, which were very like, Ugh. anyway, um, did, she just sounded aggressive. I know now in hindsight, that's not the truth. But uh, that being said, um, when 
Dan Savage did the It Gets Better campaign. If you remember that, we were losing a lot of young gay men to suicide, uh, especially across America, but uh, in, in, in Canada, certainly as well. Um, on, and those are just the ones that were publicized, of course. And so the It Gets Better campaign was pretty lo- pretty huge at that point. And I decided to do one at my the school that I was at. And uh, so I set up a camera with my friend and we filmed all these It Gets Better videos. And um, we actually, you know, uh, we, 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 we the reps from Global news came to interview us and i was like great uh this is this is cool um we're getting the the broad the the attention it deserves and uh it ended up being aired on global national Mm -hmm. um and i was being interviewed and they were talking about what it's like being a gay guy and all these experiences of me being gay and whatnot and i didn't know at the time that i would be interviewed when i let my parents know at that point that you should maybe watch the tv tonight i didn't say why but i was like you're you might see something you watch tv um and they're like okay whatever cool and so i didn't know this but they were like apparently rob wants us to watch this tv so they tell my grandmother they tell my friend they tell their friends they tell all these things rob watches tv um so global national airs nationally and um that's how everyone from my hometown including my grandmother found out that i was gay and the best part about this was my mother was like hysterical because she thought that this news would essentially kill my grandmother because my, my mother didn't like her. But when I finally <laughs> got to meet my grandmother a couple of months later, I was I was sweating. I was like, I haven't talked to her since this. I have no idea what she's going to say. They're like traditional family, gender roles, like man, woman, blah. And the first thing she does, she comes up to me with her finger pointing at me as grandmothers do. And she was just like, what's this I hear about you being one of those vegans? <laughs> I was like, because I, like, I was vegan at the time. And I'm like, well. <laughs> and then she didn't care. And it was the most, um, it was a heartwarming reaction because she was more pissed off that I wouldn't eat meat. Yeah, that's hilarious. Yeah. I love that. Really that. T- mm. Yeah, so. Yeah, anyway, that's nice. It's a good last memory of her, so. So your mom was yeah. hysterical because she thought it would kill her in like a good way. <laughs> like, no, like I, so she's hoping. like, oh, if I could have been a fly on the wall in oh, that room when okay. your grandmother saw that. She's like, uh, all I all I did was tell your grandma to watch the news. I didn't say why my mother was roaring with laughter. Okay. Um, they had an oil and water relationship. So she mm-hmm. was just mostly excited to see like my grandmother get shook. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the- well, that's a good story for sure. <laughs> it is a good story. Thank you for listening to Stories from Grandparents. If you have any interest in submitting stories or if you want to participate on the podcast, please send us an email at storiesfromgrandparentspodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It really helps us out.